1. The summer after graduating high school, 2018, I got a job as a barista in a chain grocery store. They hired me fairly late in the summer, so I was only there for about a month and a half before I left college, in a city about one and a half hours away. I was the youngest person in our coffee shop, 18 female, fairly quiet, and didn't talk to anyone outside my immediate work area. There was this one guy that worked in the store gathering carts, Rick. Rick would stand outside our kiosk staring at us without ever actually addressing us. I was told he did that a lot, and was coming for water. It was fairly uncomfortable, but I just wrote it off as him being socially awkward, even though he appeared more and more frequently throughout the day while I was working there. One lunch break. Rick was the only other person in the break room besides myself. He, for whatever reason, decided he would question me about unions, I didn't know much, and lectured me about them for the rest of the lunch break. I just smiled and nodded. Once again, nothing too bad, just kind of random and odd. Later that night, I got a Facebook request from Rick. I was thrown off because he didn't know anything about me, besides my first name and the fact that I worked there. I just ignored him. Then the next day at work, he came to the coffee kiosk and actually mentioned he had sent a request, and I just kind of smiled and went back to work. The next day I came into work and opened the kiosk alone. Rick came in and was angry. He blocked the only exit into the stand and kept asking me why I didn't accept a request. I honestly was scared and I didn't have anyone to help or anywhere to go, so I got out my phone and accepted the request. Rick is well over six feet tall, and I am just over five foot, so I was terrified that he could easily overpower and intimidate me. I avoided him to the best of my ability after this incident. I will say my profile only said where I was from and the city where I was currently located. This is important for later. Rick ended up moving about three weeks after I started working there. He messaged a couple of times asking for me to visit him. I quickly blocked him and thought that was the end of it once I quit and moved away for college. Spring semester of 2020, a little over a year and a half later, I was running across campus to catch the school shuttle, and his final stop to go to the dorm so I wouldn't have to wait 20 minutes until the next one. Now I could have walked home, but it's very cold where I live this time of year and wasn't practical. So I got on the shuttle, and there was only two other people on there. I didn't pay much attention to them because I was out of breath and sat down behind them, Lo and behold, the first person in front of me turned around and it was Rick. I hadn't seen or heard of him since he moved away and was thrown off. First thing he told me was, Didn't you used to work at the store we used to work at? I said yes because I am a very bad liar when put on the spot. He asked if I was still studying psychology and I once again said yes. He then asked where I live on campus and I just said the apartments. There were eight different buildings there and unfortunately... He said he lived in the building before mine. When the shuttle finally got to the dorms, Rick let me off first, so I hauled ass to my building, because I knew he could see exactly where I lived from his building and by walking behind me. I prayed he didn't see where I went, since he walked slowly and tried to forget about the interaction. Two weeks later, I waited for the shuttle at a different stop, and just because I got out of class early and didn't have to run to catch it elsewhere... I was standing against this wall in the entryway of the building, and from where I was I could only be seen by people from the inside of the building. I was playing on my phone, and when I looked up Rick was standing right in front of me, effectively blocking me into the corner. There was fifteen minutes until the next shuttle came, and I couldn't leave. Rick asked me why I wasn't waiting at the other stop. It threw me off because I had only gone to the other shuttle stop once two weeks ago, when he first saw me. Once again, being the bad liar I was, I said I was there because of classes. He then began a whole line of questioning that went something like this. I'm looking at the texts I sent my friend while panicking, and he definitely went way more into depth with each of these. So do you still have Facebook? I don't have it anymore because all my accounts got blocked. I can't even get a service dog because someone reported me for dogfighting on the Facebook page. That's why I can't get on Facebook or have a service dog. I didn't do it. People report me because they say I'm emotionless. It's just who I am. So, do you do the weed? You should try it. Might help you relax. Yes, he did say do the weed. Do you still work at the store? Why aren't you there? Where'd you work now? Do you have any alternate ways of making money? 
You know you could make a lot of money doing alternative work. He was looking me up and down while saying this, and I felt like he was asking if I did sexual favors for money by the way he looked at me and asked. Do you remember this manager from the store? He got arrested for embezzling and sexually assaulting girls there. How do you feel about him? Do you like him? Now this last one scared the shit out of me because the way he said it, it almost seemed like he admired the guy. Rick said what the manager did with what I could only describe as pride. This line of questioning continued while on the shuttle and only stopped once someone got on and walked in front of him talking to me. I took this opportunity to put in headphones and keep my head down and only look at my phone. I could see out of the corner of my eye that he was staring at me and looked frustrated. Once again, when the shuttle got to the dorms, he let me off ahead of him, even though I was a row behind and across from him. I ran home and kept looking back to make sure he couldn't see where I was going. I started staying late and coming early to my classes so my schedule was less predictable. Somehow I'd still see him around, but I would keep my head down and pretend I didn't see him. Now these interactions didn't seem horrible until I thought about one specific detail. Rick knew I was studying psychology. When I originally applied for college, I was a nursing major. I didn't change my major until after I blocked him and moved away for school. This wasn't public information on my profile at the time. Now, I don't know how he's been keeping tabs on me, but somehow he has been for the past one and a half years. He was also keeping track of what shuttles I've been going on, and which time so he could see me. I started walking to my classes despite the cold. And when my boyfriend moved out of the state, he gave me his car so I wouldn't have to see Rick again. He also hasn't contacted me on social media, so I don't have any proof except my word that this guy has been following me, best way I can describe it. And I can't reach out to campus security for help. Rick, if you're listening to this, let's not meet again. 2. I was 20 at the time and single and ready to mingle. I was studying at a school about 28 minutes away from my house, and, of course, I was on Tinder. Now I have dated some older men, I'm attracted to them, so my setting on Tinder for males was always ages 25 to 40. I swiped right on the guy who looked decent enough, and he was 36. We match, and he begins to message me. We go through a day or two of messaging. I explain that I'm really just looking for a fuck buddy. He had his own apartment, and about a two-minute walk away from my school. Perfect. We add each other on Snapchat and Insta, and once he takes a look through all my pictures, his way of messaging becomes strange. He starts to message me stuff on Snapchat like, You're so beautiful, I want to hold you in my arms. You're like an angel. Now, mind you, we have never met. Once he starts messaging me like this, I realize he's not my type, especially in a friends with benefits type situation. I don't need someone like that. I start to leave him on red and ignore his messages. The next weekend, I was going to a wedding. I was all dressed up, and of course, I posted a few pictures to my story, which he immediately started commenting on, like, Oh my god, you're so beautiful, I miss your touch. I want to feel you in my arms. I ignore him. Have a good time at the wedding, and right before the wedding started, I popped an edible. By the time I got home, it was midnight, and I was very, very high and very, very sleepy. I had worked earlier that day and hadn't napped in between. I get into bed and start to go through my phone. I live with my family and everyone was asleep. I start getting messages from this guy again and I'm so high and tired that I'm reading them, giving brief responses saying, aw, thanks. Then he messages me saying, I think I'm going to come to the city I live in tonight. That's about 30 minutes away from his apartment. I respond by saying, oh, that's weird. Don't do that. Obviously thinking that he is joking. Then he says, I want to breathe the same air as you. I want to feel you. I want to breathe with you. I begin to freak out, and he starts messaging me like, Be there soon, babe. I'm like super scared now because I live with my family and I didn't want anything weird happening. Then all of a sudden I remember that my snap map location is on. I go into my map and I see my little bitmoji in her cute outfit sitting at my house. I quickly turn myself onto ghost mode. Then I see his little bit emoji, and is getting closer and closer to my city. I somehow convince myself that he's joking, he's probably on his way to another city near mine. But he's getting closer and closer, it's 1.30 in the morning right now. For the first time in years, I begin to pray. Ten minutes later, I check the snap map again. Now, even if you are in ghost mode, you can see if you're sharing locations with someone, although the other person can't. 
When I looked at my map, I was sharing location with him. He was right outside my house. I looked out my window and there was a car with its lights on. At this point, I'm so freaked out, my heart is inside my throat, my anxiety is through the roof, and I'm still high. I end up passing out, then falling asleep. I wake up in the morning, scared. I check my phone. He had sent a few messages saying, You have a beautiful street, baby, a beautiful home. Have a good night, baby. I go into my mom's room to ensure nothing had happened, and she was fine. I later went to work, and after work, I went to the police station and spoke with them. They said they couldn't do anything unless he tried to come over again, and that's when I would call the police. I went home, and for a few days, I got no messages, and then, at 5 a.m. on the following Tuesday, I got a message. Even though I drove all the way to your home to breathe the same air as you, you have still not messaged me. I'm not as desperate as I seem. If you ever want this dick up until the balls, let me know. Since then, I've heard from him once in a while, but I eventually blocked him. I didn't block him from the start because he knew where my house was. I was scared that if he couldn't get hold of me, he would show up. So, creepy asshole who showed up at my house in the middle of the night, let's not meet. 3. I just want to start off by saying that to make this story easier to understand, I'm going to use a lot of dialogue. Obviously, this wasn't recorded, so these aren't the exact words of anyone involved in this experience. I'm just trying to tell it as best as possible, and I think it'll benefit me and you if I use a lot of quotes. Just keep in mind, most of it is not direct. This happened in 2015, when I was 16 and still living in my hometown. A forgotten little beach town in the middle of nowhere that's so remote, it's probably not even known by surrounding areas. Basically, there's three things you can do there as a teenager. Go to the movies, swim, or go to this pathetic little place called Miller's Fun Park. It's relatively similar to a lot of fun park type things, only a whole lot worse. There's a crappy arcade with broken skee-ball machines, batting cages that probably haven't been used since the early 80s. A pathetic mini-golf course, and the most dangerous go-kart you've probably ever seen in your life. Seriously. Miller's Fun Park is on the edge of a field. On the opposite side of the field, about three miles down it is the beach, and across the single street are woods. If our town is in the middle of nowhere, Miller's is practically on the moon. Anyway, getting into the story. My cousin Emma and I decided one summer night that we wanted to go go-karting. It was around 10pm, so we knew it'd be almost deserted, but that was the way we liked it. I picked her up from her house, and we made the long drive down. Once we had arrived and parked in the nearly empty lot, we hopped out of the car and paid for some go-karting tickets. The same people had worked there forever, I swear to God. There was no one there except for a few boys in the arcade, and a guy who looked to be in his 60s sitting on a bench near the batting cages. Emma and I paid him no mind, and we went to the go-kart track. Like I said, these carts were incredibly dangerous, so I was focused on nothing but making sure I wasn't going to skid and flip as we raced far too fast around the windy track. This is why I didn't notice a guy walking over to the fence, and why I didn't notice him watching us until we pulled into the lanes after our last lap. He was standing on the other side of the fence, right where I parked. He stared at me with the most unsettling expression, a creepy smile playing on his cracked lips as his dark eyes gleamed. I managed an uneasy smile back, handed another ticket to the guy running the go-karts, it was obviously higher than a kite, and Emma and I went off again. This time I couldn't focus. The dude gave me the worst type of feeling. My eyes were constantly finding their way to the metal fence where he stood, unmoving and watching us every time we were in his view. And the thing that was bothering me the most was that we had bought three tickets, we were on our second to last run, and he was standing directly next to the exit gate. I was just praying he'd move before we were done. But of course, no such luck. One last go came and went, and I had no choice but to pull in next to him, unbuckle my seatbelt, and get out of my go-kart. I glanced over at Emma a few feet away as I opened the exit gate to see if she was as scared as I was. But she didn't seem to notice as she bounced over and bragged about how she had beat me the last two times. I was barely listening. I opened the gate, and the guy stepped in front of me just as I was leaving. Hey there, he said. His voice was dry and he smelled of cigarettes. What are you cute girls doing all alone here? My eyes darted over to Emma, who was looking at the dude with both confusion and annoyance. Uh, what? 
she said, pushing past the gate so she stood beside me. It's so late. His tone was as hungry as his eyes, and he reminded me of a snake. Do your parents know you're out? Yes, I answered quickly. They're waiting for us, actually. We need to get going. That was a lie and probably sounded like it from my tone, but I tried to push past him anyway. It didn't work. He grabbed my shoulder to keep me in front of him. Nonsense. I saw you girls pull up alone. My heart dropped to my stomach. He had? Are you heading out? Why don't I walk you to your car? He starts inching toward me, and I look to Emma for help. With one swift movement, she pulled me halfway behind her and started sizing the guy up. This was pretty dumb, as we're both small, and though she's a few inches taller than me, neither of us were anywhere near his size. This guy clears six too easy, but she doesn't seem to care. Actually, we were just headed to the arcade, she says harshly. Her boyfriend is going to meet us here. I did have a boyfriend at the time, but he wasn't coming. He wasn't even in town. I knew she knew this. The guy's face immediately changes, his smile disappeared, and he was now glaring down at me with a look of annoyance in his eyes. I felt myself start to cover. Boyfriend, he said roughly. Emma didn't give me time to say anything. She grabbed my arm and tugged me behind her into the arcade. The boys from before had already left, and the usual girl who worked in there was nowhere to be found. Still, it felt safer than outside. We ran to the back and hid behind the claw machine. What the hell do we do? I left my phone in my car. I whisper shouted. There was no way I was going to be out there alone, and the pothead go-kart guy had already disappeared into the small ticket shack. I don't have mine either, I left it charging, she said face palming. We're just gonna have to make a run for it. Are you crazy? He's probably waiting for us in the parking lot. What about the guy who runs the go-karts? We could get him to walk us out. She said, I just shook my head. He's as high as Mount Everest right now. I don't want to risk running all the way to the ticket stand for nothing. Then we have no choice. She stood up, pulling me with her. Let's go. I swallowed hard, wanting to cry. I'd never been that scared before. There was something so wrong about the guy. We made our way out of the arcade, looking around to see if he's nearby. The park was now absolutely deserted. Emma practically had to drag me to the exit. I was looking every direction, every second, waiting for the guy to come out of the woods or something, and pounce on us at any second. But he didn't. Everything was still. Get your keys out, Emma instructed, and I pulled them from my pocket. We were about 20 feet from my car when I stopped dead in my tracks. What? She whispered. I stared at the car, keys in hand. I had never locked it. I never locked the car, Emma. What? I didn't lock it. What if... I trailed off, but she knew what I was saying. She started inching towards the car, and I grabbed her arm to stop her, but she pulled away. I'm just going to peek. If I say run, you run. Her voice is quiet. I nodded shakily. Eventually, we made it close enough to see inside, but by the way she was squinting, I knew it was too dark to make anything out. My heart was beating out of my chest. What if he's in there? What if he jumps out? Or what if we get in and he asphyxiates me like in the movies? All these thoughts almost drown out the unmistakable sound of shoes slamming against the pavement. My head whipped around instantly and there he was, sprinting at his full speed out of the woods. I screamed bloody murder and broke for the car, jiggling the handle as I realized I had locked it. Emma was already on the other side, screaming at me to unlock it. I fumbled with the keys, but managed not to drop them as I unlocked the door. Flung it open and practically threw myself inside. I just managed to close the door when he was there, slamming his fist against the window and shouting incoherently. I was sobbing at this point and barely managed to lock the doors as he goes for the handle and yanks on it, hard as he can. Emma was screaming at me to go, and through my tears I shoved the key into the ignition and flew into reverse. He was still chasing us and yelling as I veered backwards out of the lot, and turned fast as I could while slamming on the gas. I was driving like I was still in a go-kart, but I didn't care. I could barely see the road through the flood of tears, and Emma had to grab the wheel several times to keep us from crashing before I regained some composure. Though obviously shaken up, she had managed to keep her tears in, and be the sane one out of the two of us as we drove the last 30 miles over the speed limit, the whole way back to my house. We didn't tell either of our parents about this, and looking back I wish we had, because there was something seriously wrong with that guy. But we were too scared of what they might say or do. I think we thought they'd blame us somehow. So it stayed a secret between us, something we didn't even talk about until months after the horrifying encounter. Safe to say we never went back to Miller's Fun Park after that, 
I urge you all to be extremely careful when going out at night. And to the lunatic who tried to do God knows what to my cousin and I, let's never meet again. Hey everybody, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to Three True Scary Stories, episode 485. And thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. If you know anyone who might enjoy the video, then please do give it a share, that's very helpful to me. Okie dokie. Let's see, where are we? What what date is this? Date, 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 April 1st. Uh, so basically every single thing you hear today, apart from me, because I don't lie, that was also probably a lie, uh, but basically take anything you you hear today with pinch or a bag of salt, if you can actually find any salt, if it's not all been bought up in the supermarkets. Uh, yeah. Okay. Enough grumble, grumble, grumble. Enough of that. I'm going to head off for now. So until next time, thank you very much for listening, and take very good care of yourselves.